Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Pleasure to be with you today. And on the show a little bit later on, I am featuring Susie Carter, who's going to be talking about winning the game of money. The show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. And so if you would like to become a facilitator or attend one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or access consciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger and I teach business owners, coaches, coaches, entrepreneurs, speakers, healers, all of you, the time effective steps to write a highly engaging book. I just finished doing a two day book incubator. There are no words for what it feels like for me to work with mostly beginning authors and have them after two days leave a workshop experience confident and knowing how to write a book. So I just released many people out into the world after that workshop and I'm very excited to see the books that they turn up. And if you would like to do the same, you can join us. Just write to me at debbie-dashinger.com or better yet, I've got a free gift for you. It's got templates. It's got all the ways you can become visible today. So get your free gift and your videos and start becoming visible by writing books, becoming a bestseller and being interviewed on podcast and radio. Go to debbie-dashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. This podcast, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger, has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, and I will be in Denver, Colorado, the weekend after this as a finalist for a Coalition of Visionary Resources Award. We are also listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. And today's show will also deliver because this episode is about how to power your profit and scale up your business. I'm going to hold up the book. So if you're on podcast and want to check us out visually, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. This is Power Your Profits. <laughs> and it's written by my guest, Susie Carter, who started out as a low paid hairdresser, supporting her two little girls. And when working for someone else was a challenge, ooh, can we not relate to that? Susie decided to create her own business and she went on to build two $10 million companies. Susie is a globally recognized profitability coach and inventor of the predictable success method. Her radical business strategies have helped thousands of entrepreneurs and small business owners achieve exponential growth and triple their profits. She's been featured in the New York Times, the Associated Press, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and NBC News. And Susie has worked with top business moguls like John Assaraf, Lisa Nichols, Steve Harvey. Oh, that must be fun. Doug Carter and Paul Mitchell. Her latest book, as I just held up, is Power Your Profits, Teaching a Plan for Taking Your Business from Startup Modality to the Multi-Million Dollar Mark. Find out more about her and her book and her business at suzycarter.com. It's S-U-S-I-E-C-A-R-D-E-R.com. And with that, I welcome Susie Carter to the Dare to Dream show. It's so great to have you. So great to be had. Thank you so much. And more importantly, Debbie, thank you for what you do for our industry. We need more people telling the truth, holding the flag, holding possibility, making us visible, right, to get the attention that we need so we can get paid and we can do all the things that we want to do inside of the world. So thanks for having me. Oh, man, it's such a pleasure. And it's like so about time. Great conversation. And, you know, I just want to start by saying I just recommended your book on Facebook. Someone posted in a group and said, oh, I like I got to deal with my finances. Is there a book anybody recommends? I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> I got your Amazon link to power your profits. I posted about it. I copied all the information from Amazon that your book was about. I'm like, go forth and prosper. 
That is awesome. Thank you. Takes a village, right? Even this is book number 10 and still takes a village on book number 10. So it's a process mm -hmm. of, you know, how do you create a business? And the book's all about my journey of building, you know, two, two $10 million businesses, 10 multi-million dollar companies. Like it's a journey, right? It's once you figure out the system, like in anything, you teach people a systematic way to get seen, to get heard, to get paid. You teach people how to write their book, get it published. How do you make money at it, right? Really bringing their message to life. There's a system to it. And so when you understand the system of business, it can take away the scary. I always say it doesn't have to be hard. It has to be strategic. Oh my God. I love that. That's, um, we're going to visit that in a little bit, the system of business, powerful, powerful, because you're right, when you have a method, uh, that you, when you have a method, you have a way, and when you have discipline, you have freedom. Yes. So I have to ask you, just because I read Steve Harvey, how <laughs> fun was that working with him? It was fun. It was definitely, um, I worked behind the scenes in strategic and strategy, and it was a big ship you know, and like every business, every business is dysfunctional, right? It <laughs> doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. Debbie's business is dysfunctional. My business is dysfunctional. Steve's business is dysfunctional. The difference is, are you aware that it's dysfunctional, right? The difference between my business and somebody else's, I'm clear what our dysfunction is, right? So that we can improve upon it. We don't let that dysfunction run us, right? Same thing with Steve. He, he knew there was things that needed to be improved upon inside of his business and said, I need to work on this, right? And that's when he his thought was he wanted to foray into public speaking and really do that versus stand-up comedy. And when he saw the business side of it, he was like, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> Especially as a creative, it's like, oh, please take it. So it's a big conglomeration, right? Big yeah. corporation. So we worked with a lot of this team. Um, Lisa Nichols worked with him. I was the president CEO of that organization. So she was coaching him on our speaking training and we were working on strategy in the background of everything that has to get done in order to make a mega star. A mega star doesn't just happen, right? There is a plan behind it. There's people behind it. There's strategy behind it. You can't be a mega star without a team of people, mm -hmm. right? That is a misnomer. You don't get famous overnight. Right. And so to shorten the learning curve, you want to look at who are the people I need around me? What kind of coaches, what kind of experts, what kind of mentors do I need to help me through whatever it is I'm trying to get through to the next next level? You can do it the hard way and the long way and do it yourself and figure it out. Or you can find those experts that can really help you shorten that learning curve. Yeah, absolutely. So big on the hiring piece. And I heard something years ago, and I want to riff on what you just said and check in to find out your point of view. I mean, years ago, probably easily 13 years ago, I've been on air for 15, so about 13 years ago, I know exactly it was, big businesswoman out in the world. And I, I remember the time being very impressed with how she ran her business. And it seemed like she had a paw in every pie, but she told me on air, not really. I have so much automated. I don't have to work that hard. But she said, I'll tell you a secret. Every time I make more money, I pay myself more, but then I hire someone else. Mm -hmm. I keep increasing my team. And I thought that was genius at the time. What do you think about that? Well, the first person I always hire in any business is the operations person. Right. So if you look at a business, 15 percent of why you're successful is the vocation that you're in. So 15%, if you're a doctor, it's you being a doctor. If you are a therapist, it's how you communicate, with, how you do your therapy sessions. If you're a graphic designer, it's how you design. The other 85% is sales, marketing, operations, and finance, which nobody teaches us that, right? We just all go and jump in this entrepreneur pool and then have to realize, uh-oh, I have to do it all, be it all. Well, I learned early on the operations is the get it done person. And so if I'm out front being the coach, the speaker, the trainer, the deliverer, the fulfillment of the programs that we sell, I need someone managing the back end, mm -hmm. right? That's operations. I've always had the philosophy of hire somebody smarter than me. As entrepreneurs, you gotta put your ego or she go aside. Because <laughs> if your ego or she go gets in the way, you're not gonna want smarter people around you because you wanna be the smartest one 
at the table. I don't have to be the smartest one at the table. It actually is more beneficial if I work with someone who's smarter than me because I don't want to have to come up with the, all, all the strategy and ideas. Mm. I want someone else thinking and rowing the boat with me. And so I have hired some amazing talent under fair market value. Because the number one, there's a couple of reasons why people come to us in an industry. It's one, they want to make a difference. Two, they want to feel like they're contributing, right? Three is managing their lifestyle and their work. Four is compensation. So when you look at what other things can I give people to track them, right? I used to be nervous, like, well, I really want to hire you, Debbie, but I don't have that kind of money, right? Putting incentives in place, looking at what are the non-compensation that you're giving to people, which is autonomy, feeling appreciated, right? F getting other kind of rewards, prizes, incentive, and verbal acknowledgement. There's so much more than just a paycheck, mm -hmm. right? Think about all the things that you've done over the years, Debbie, that wasn't, you didn't do it for the money, right? And maybe you took less money, but you wanted to make a difference or it's like that project I want to be involved in. Right. So look at to find those smart people and go, what what would get them incentivized? I'll pay people whatever they want. They just have to create the result. I'm not going to just bl blanketly write a check. You want to manage people's results, pay them on the results they create, not their time. Yeah. So I love that. So when you say operations manager, you mean the person at the top of the umbrella, the business manager who will manage what you're doing and then everybody you hire henceforth. Yeah, so we're hiring them together, but the operations is this is how you do it here. This is how we receive money. This is how we funnel the money. This is where we put the money. This is how we do the checks and balances. This is what we're doing with the marketing. I need a marketing person. I'm going to hire the marketing person. They're, they're managing the minutia of the business, especially at a small level. Right now, when I say small, you're doing under a million dollars, right? So under a million dollars, you can get away with running probably a quarter of a million dollars on your own. But after that, you have to have other team. And instead of hiring the assistant first, I hire an operations. I'm paying more money per hour, but they get 10 times more done than an assistant will. And then once we hit more sales, then we go, what's the next person we hire, which normally might be an assistant for me, right? So. You want to look at what is the biggest bang for your buck that would give you the biggest result that your business needs right now. And it's usually not an admin person because an admin person, I have to manage. I got to tell them what to do. I don't, I don't have time to tell people what to do. I need you to hit the ground running. I need you to start paying for yourself. I need you to get some stuff done. <laughs> oh, yeah. I always tell my team, if I have to tell you how to do your job, one of us isn't needed. <laughs> mm, I love that that they really start earning the money because the more you earn, the better they're going to do too. Everybody right. And when you're straight with people and you're clear with people, I'm not rude about it, but if you have to keep coming to me, and that's what I hear with most business owners, most leaders is I've got to tell them what to do. I'm like, then you're hiring the wrong people, right? If you have to tell, if you have to tell a marketing person, what's the marketing campaign, that's the wrong person. Unless you're the marketing expert. I'm not the marketing expert. Right. I'm a business strategist looking at where's the money, how's the money, how are we making the money, how are we pricing our product and services, what's our financial projections, right? And then everything else, we look at, I need a sales people, marketing, operations, and finance. Those are the people you need in your business. Now, corporations have divisions of those people. We as small entrepreneurs, right, we might have one person that does several different things. And so when you look at the book, the book isn't written, it's written um, very systematically, but it's not written where you can't go if you suck at math and you, you hate doing financial projections, go to chapter eight, math is money, money is fun. Skip the rest of it because you need to figure that out. If you are horrible at sales, <laughs> go to chapter six, selling your services because I give you my $100,000 script. You don't need to read chapter one, chapter two. No, go to what you need. That's how I am as an entrepreneur. If I need a marketing campaign, a referral campaign, I'm going to go take a class on it, learn how to do it, and then implement it tomorrow, right? So anything, that's most entrepreneurs. So look at what does my business need right now? And every chapter has an assessment so you can assess where your business is, right? I love assessments. Remember taking those as kids, right? Maybe in Cosmo magazine, or we might still take those, right? Where you get to see where am I at? How am I doing? It allows you to self-assess truthfully what's working and not working. 
And then you get a roadmap for, <coughs> excuse me, building your team, building your finances, building your operations and building your sale. Your book gave me a lot of confidence, by the way. I, I really was reading it at exactly the right time. I, on the side, my boyfriend and I have a band. It's a very uplifting music. Occasionally we'll do sound bath, meditation stuff. We get booked for all sorts of gigs. We became a nonprofit this year and um, we're going for grants and funds because we want to reach a lot more people with our music. It is an amazing time uh, to heal through music. Mm -hmm. And in filling out these grant applications like <laughs> nobody prepares you for yes. that many pages of accountability the verbiage i did okay but when i came to all the strategy business projections money 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 so my mo when i get up to that is i get so overwhelmed i just want to shut down and run i cannot even and so your book just kept very um, gently but firmly driving home the importance of knowing your numbers like you can't go anywhere without understanding what you're operating with and i had no idea in that right. realm and so i hired i thought I, I have to keep moving forward susie says you know you can do this <laughs> and so i just hired somebody and oh i was so grateful you know they were able to take all of this like pasta on the wall and make it into something not only that makes sense that we could submit but now I have something that I can look at as an outline. So thank you for getting me through that energetically. Well, and the thing you need to know is you already knew the information. You just didn't know how to put it in that account form, right? That's what, because I created this conversation for myself. I am not a CPA. I am not a mathematical whiz. Thank God we have calculators for everything we do, right? I've got three of them on my desk right now. And your right? cell phone. Right. And so you know the information because the person had to extract that information from you and then put it in a formula that that, that um, grant would, would speak their language to. But you knew the information, right? You knew the pricing. You knew, well, we, probably, we need this many customers or we need this or we need that. We, we sell this. We sell that. All they did is speak the language of that grant. And so that's why I named, you know, that chapter eight, math is money, money is fun. Because nobody likes to do math. I didn't like to do math. But I knew that if I was going to understand my business and understand how to create profitability and understand how to excel and increase my business 20, 30, 40, 50% every year, I had to understand the formulas. Right. Everything is a mathematical formula. Sorry, I know you hate that, but it is. How many customers do you need to see? Mathematical equation. What are they buying? Mathematical equation. What's the average ticket? Mathematical equation. How should I price my services? Mathematical equation. Right. Who's opening your emails? Mathematical equation. Right. So it's like, oh, we're making it too difficult. And so in every chapter, I give you a simple spreadsheet. Right? So that again, I'm trying to make it easy. And these aren't CPA spreadsheets. These are rogue entrepreneur spreadsheets. So if you're a CPA and you're looking at it, it wasn't designed for you. It was designed for us, the creative entrepreneur, to understand what do I have to charge to be profitable? Yes. And you have this whole chapter about upping the amount that we're making. And it was so good that I've shared it with people and given you credit because I live in Los Angeles, very expensive place to live. Very expensive place. <laughs> yes. And as you know, everybody knows prices right now, gasoline, produce, et cetera, everything has gone up exponentially. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to keep your prices the same and struggle and suffer? Or are you going to meet the demands for yourself and your life and also for what you give? And that that's really a smart way to look at things kind of takes out the, ooh, will they pay this question? And, right. you know, it, it's way more into a number, into a number that makes sense for what you're delivering and makes sense for the style and the amount it takes to live today. Well, I want to tell you a secret. And, I, you know, I don't share this very often, but it's important to understand. We were an award-winning business. And when I mean award-winning business accolades, we won top business of the year. We won top productivity of the year, top 1% in the nation, top 10% in the world. We were in every magazine for that industry 
honoring us, celebrating us, right? It was a huge win for us from an ego standpoint. At the end of the year, Debbie, we lost $70,000. So how can I be an award-winning business and getting all these accolades from my industry? I had to turn in my P&Ls. I had to turn in, you had to turn in my numbers. So everyone's looking at the top line, which was the million dollars. It was 1.2, right? We did it with a small amount of people. We had six people where the average business has to do that with 30 people. But we lost $70,000. And I remember sitting down with my partner, my accountant going, this makes no sense. I work way too, what, what is wrong? Why am I losing money? Right. And they're like, well, let's dig in. Right. And so we were, we were so efficient. We knew our numbers. We knew what every person had to do, but see my business was set up on this was set up from a superstar, meaning every person had to sell multiple services, multiple products. Well, if you had an average person in your business, that only did the bare minimal, my business was failing. So I had two people that were only doing the minimal. And so I realized that their pricing was off by almost $25 per customer. $25 per customer times the amount of customers they did for the year is $70,000. That's my paycheck, that's my IRA, that's paying off of your car. That's, what would you do with $70,000? And I called bullshit, Debbie, I'm like, Bullshit. This is, I do not deserve. Okay, some accolades I do, but when you get into the meat and potatoes of it, it's like, I want to tell people the truth to go, it can look one way. And then there's a whole nother story. So I dug in and sat down with my accountant and said, I need a spreadsheet. I didn't know how to make spreadsheets. I didn't know how to use Excel. I need to know what the absolute minimum we have to charge in order for this business to be profitable, not just break even. And that's when we realized we had to raise our prices across the board. Some, some services raised $40, some services raised $10, right? So, but across the board in order to do it. So no longer when Debbie came in and wanted to hook up, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is a price because I'm not willing to lose $70,000. Most entrepreneurs don't know that number because what we do is we pull it out of our genius zone. We go, oh, what's Debbie charging? Debbie charges 5,000. Oh, what's Susie charge? Susie charges 7,000. Oh, what's Teresa charging? She charges 10,000. Well, I'm gonna charge, and I'm pulling it from my genius home from behind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna charge 4,500. Well, what's your overhead? Does Debbie have team members? Do I have team members? Am I, am I doing Facebook ads, YouTube ads, right? Am I spending money, right? That's where you start getting into it because every time you do an ads campaign, that's coming out of somewhere. And for us, it was coming out of our profit, right? It was coming out of that top line and it wasn't included in our pricing because nobody ever taught me that, right? And so all of a sudden you're like, nobody's teaching us this. So I like to teach what's behind the black curtain to go, I know what's good in theory, but at the end of the day, if we're not making money, it's gonna come out of Debbie's paycheck, it's gonna come out of my paycheck, right? That's why so many entrepreneurs right, are struggling in their burnout and their fried, right? I remember my team being paid more than me and I was pissed because I'm working twice as hard as I felt as they were. They were working hard too. But to go, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. And so in, in that chapter eight, right, when you look at math is money, money is fun, right, that we give you the base price worksheet that says, here's what your base price needs to be with profit in order for your business to survive. So no more guessing, no more going, I can't charge a thousand, whatever that number is, a thousand, forty-five dollars, whatever the number is, it's all an algorithm and it's all a mathematical equation, right? To go, oh, this is what it has to be. And then you decide before you spend dollar one on that business, do I have the confidence to charge ten thousand dollars? Do I have the confidence to charge two hundred dollars, whatever the number is, or do I not? Because if you don't, you like my business was a slow bleeder. The only reason it was in business is because of cash flow. Money kept coming in so I could pay the bill and then the next one would be due. So it's important to understand the foundation of what does this business have to do. Then you can start doing all that fun stuff, the marketing and going and speaking and writing books. Look, writing books, that was another hilarious learning lesson because I thought, Debbie, I didn't have a Debbie back in the day. I'm just going to say, I thought I would write a book and I would be famous and I would be rich. <laughs> that didn't happen, Debbie. Both of those things did not happen. <laughs> 
right? And you have to have a book. A book is a really good credibility play, right? It's, it's so different. I didn't really know or believe that to be so true until I came out with my first book. I was like, whatever, a book, right? Oh my God, all of a sudden it was like people looked at you like you were some kind of guru and they're like, oh my God, you're that Susie that wrote that book, Passion? I'm like, I am. They're like, oh my God, can I get your autograph? And people who would not hire me previously now uh -huh. looked at me differently and said, oh, we've been watching you. Now we're ready to hire you. They didn't say what, you know, what I believe it was now I have the credibility differently. We were already an award-winning business, right? We just, we didn't have this accolade called a book, right? I didn't take the time to write it down, put it in play. It does shift the game in people's credibility and thought process about you. Absolutely. I love what you're saying. And I've uh, two completely different pieces that I want to respond to. The first is about the book. That was really funny. And I have <laughs> a client currently I'm working with very, very impressive resume. And I didn't know to we were deep into working together that he had money issues. And the money issues came out in a subsequent conversation where he was saying, well, am I going to make all my money back when we launch my book? Am I going to make everything <laughs> back and more? And I'm like, no, like, no. Royalty. Thank you for telling the truth, right? Thank you for telling the truth. <laughs> like, bup is, you know, in Yiddish, bupkis, it means nothing. Like, you know, but... But my darling, you will get rich. You will. There are treasures on the other side of a book when you know how to do them well. But to deal with somebody with money issues, right. this was a very difficult conversation because that's esoteric. He couldn't conceive. Oh, I'll get speaking gigs. I already have that. I, I could, you know, could open me up to panels or heading things up or people will think of me first because of my visibility or much like you're saying, it changed your life. It changed mine. So it's really important that piece that people remember that you may not get it back from the royalties, but you will get it back. It, it is a game changer. And the well, other I made thing, millions because of my book, not from the book. Say now, that you, again. I've made millions because of my book, mm. not from the sell of the book. Right? So we have, there's a, there's three different companion courses that go with the book. Right now, we sold a ton of books, best-selling book, still selling books. Books are an amazing lead generator. It's an easy yes, right, for people to write that. And then what we sell on the back end is how we make the money from the book. And so there has to be a full strategy around it. It's not just the book, right, when I look at. Now, one book, my first, very first book was called Passion. And my editor named the book because it was the Salon Professionals Handbook to Building a Successful Business. And she's like, that is so boring, Susie. <laughs> I'm like, but that's what it is. Look, I, girl, I was suited and booted, right? I was like, I am a professional. And so that book, I made, I'm still making money on that book 25 years later from products that I created that I get residual from. From products that I created that I get residual from. Because they were hyperlinked in the book? Or how did you do that? No, because we're still leveraging that content, still packaging that content. We have one product that goes into schools that is a comprehensive program that is the book come to life. Mm -hmm. Right? So that book has come into many different radiations of products and services. Right? It's pieces of the book. If you look at my current book, right? The current book that you you buy it by itself it's 29 dollars, right then we have a boot camp same content in the book three chapters of the book is twelve thousand dollars the book in a live course for a year is thirty five thousand dollars well you can buy the book and do it yourself or you can come into the program and get handheld through with me and my team so you look at the same content that's in the book for 29 dollars, or come into a course so when you look at how do we monetize your expertise, because that's really what we're doing, is Debbie and I want to help you monetize your expertise. And it's many different ways. The book is the foundational piece that you start with. And then we start spinning off other products, other programs, other services that allows you to capitalize on all this hard work it takes to write a book, because it really is a lot of work to write a book. Right. You just you don't even know until you do. It's like having a kid. Right. Sure. I have a couple of kids. How hard can that be? Oh, Lord <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm enjoying this conversation so much. 
<clears throat> I am. It's so, it's so refreshing. You know, you're not the only one. Thanks for pulling back the curtain on that story. Um, it's very powerful when you say, here I am up for an award, and yet behind the scenes, I'm getting information that I'm I'm not doing that well financially, and I'm I'm a money guru. So, and I understand that imposter feeling, and you're not alone. I've got a dear friend who's been also a female badass entrepreneur for a long time, very well known. And she confessed to me just this year that her accountant sat her down and said, you need to look at these numbers. You are losing money hand over fist. And it was like, whoa, huge wake up call. Yeah. So this does happen. And I, I wanna ask you because of your very unique point of view, okay, I'm gonna make this three questions. So the first thing that pops is, please let people know when you talk about there's other ways to work with you. I know you have a workshop, especially for people just starting to work with you. What is the name of that workshop and where can they find that? Yeah, so it's our Big Money Business Summit and this is a live in-person workshop. Our first one, I'm so excited, so nervous, so excited. It's like, is anyone gonna come to my party? Yes. <laughs> And so that's in September. It's the end of September, the 23rd, 24th, 25th. Um, it's three days of business building strategies, but it's going to be fun. So no get scared. It's Susie. Right. It's, it's going to be fun because I know this topic. We've got to make it fun because I, I want you to get it. I know if you're laughing, you're learning. Right. So it's got to be engaging. You come for the education. You stay for the community. We curate the most powerful people on the planet. And so we start with a business assessment to look at where is my current business? Because I want to just randomly give you content. You fill out a questionnaire before, so I do all my homework on every single student. We don't have a lot of people in our room, Debbie. We only have 50. I want to know my students. I don't want to teach to hundreds of thousands of people where I can see you in a sea of people. I've already done that in my life. I want to work with entrepreneurs that are serious about their business and they want to un- clog unblock what's stopping them in the domain of their financial realm and business all roads lead to money if you're doing the wrong mm -hmm. marketing campaign no money if you're marketing to the wrong consumer no money if your product suite isn't set up right no money all roads lead to money it took me 10 years to figure this out right and i'm teaching from building two $10 million companies and 10 multi-million dollar companies and doing it for my clients all over the world to go, don't do that, do this. Don't do that, do this. And it's funny when people resist me, I'm like, stop resisting me, just do it. And then they just do it and they're like, oh my God, this was so easy. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so we really look at business, Debbie, is like this combination lock. Remember these from school? So if you're listening, I'm holding up a combination lock, the dial one where you did three numbers. If you had one little tick off this thing, it would not open, right? Remember standing at the locker, you could be using one in the gym right now. I don't, I use the key one because these frustrate the hell out of me because exactly. in the moment of rush, I, I get, I lose it, right? One little tick off in marketing, your money won't open. Mm. One little tick off on finances and you're losing $70,000. One little tick off in operations and somebody's stealing from you. Mm -hmm. Somebody's not doing the right thing. You get the combination right, the lock opens. And so business is about understanding for your business, your dynamic, what is that? So if you want to learn your combination to your business, not theory, then come to San Diego and join us. Debbie will put it in the show notes, right? We've got amazing incentives for you to come right now. And again, there's only 50 people. So we're what's not the happy. link? Uh, I'll send it to you. Um, you go to my website, Susie Carter, C-A-R-D as in dollar and dinero, E-R. <laughs> Don't mess, don't mess that up, Susie Carter, and go to our events page, right? Live event and click on that and you can register. Perfect. Right? So make it really easy. You can find you can find me everywhere just by my name, Susie Carter, on our social, on Pinterest and LinkedIn and in Insta and Facebook and all the things and the Twitters and the... <laughs> and she's got her own money podcast too, which is, I've listened to several of the episodes. I've been on the show, very worthwhile. So also check out Susie's podcast. So you as an expert, here's the big question. What do you see over and over and over again that if you could stand up in front of humanity and just yell and say, please stop yes. doing these three things. These three things will change your life and your business if you'll only stop doing them. What are the patterns, Susie, that you the see? first thing 
is get it on paper. Get it out of your head. Uh, 97% of entrepreneurs that come to me have no business plan. Or if they have a business plan, it's in their head. I need you to get it out of your head because every single team member on your team will be looking at that plan to make sure we're marketing to the right customer. We're pricing things. In your business plan, you're gonna look at your sales, marketing operations, and finance. Even before you spend dollar one, if you put your financial projections together and they don't make your heart sing, do another business. Because a lot of times we go, oh, I'm going to do this business and think like I thought. I'm going to write a book and be famous. I'm going to open a business and be rich. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then how long will it take you to start paying yourself a proper paycheck? 80% of small businesses are grossing $100,000 a year. Grossing. That's not, that's, that's, they're not making that. That's what they gross in their business. Only 2.5% of small businesses hit a half a million and only 1.7% hit a million dollar mark. Y'all are making it way too hard because you won't get it out of your head. I need it out of your head. The second thing you need to do is you've got to look at your numbers. We've got to put financial projections together. Right, and what I found in the 30 years I've been coaching businesses and building businesses myself is people can either manage units, like how many things do I need to sell, or dollars. Most entrepreneurs go, oh, I can sell 10 of those things. But if I said sell $350,000, you'll be like, I can't sell that. But if I said go sell 10, you're like, oh, I can sell 10. So much easier than sell $350,000 or a million, whatever the number is. So again, find a CPA, a coach, an accountant, somebody that will speak your language. You don't have to mold to them. They have to mold to you, right? To go, I, I remember working with Lisa Nichols, a brilliant speaker, brilliant woman. She could not get the, the numbers. And I was just patient to go, let's go over it again. Here's how much we're gonna gross. Here's how much we're gonna net. This is what net means. This is why we have this PL. This is why we have that PL. I didn't get frustrated with her. She was hungry to understand it. Right. And and finally, I remember being in a meeting with her one day and she is just rattling off numbers. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so proud. Look at her <laughs> like a big girl. <laughs> but that's the thing you need is you gotta find coaches that are willing to speak your language, right? And raise you to where you need to be, right? To to show you so you understand it and get it. Like you said, you read that that chapter and you're like, oh, I get it now. I, I understand what I need to put in place to make this happen. And so, and then the third thing is hire people smarter than you to help you get to that goal. You will spend more money, but you will get more efficiency from that person that can take you to that next level, right? Your team should inspire you. Your team should wow you. Right. Again, if you have to tell people what to do, one of you isn't needed. Mm -hmm. So good. All right. <laughs> so those three things. Beautiful. And on page 159 of your book, I've got a quote here, which reads, bear in mind that business is designed to have conflict and chaos. That's in on, on a side note. That's in regards to operations infrastructure. So, Susie, what do you mean by designed to have conflict and chaos. It's so funny, I just got chills. <laughs> so think about it. Sales, the sales department, and, and you might be sales, marketing, operations, finance. You might be all these people, right? And if you have a business partner, probably you're doing half, they're doing half, whatever that is. So marketing always wants more money to get more clients. Finance department is saying we have no money. Sales is saying, but we need to spend the money to get the money so I can sell the thing. And finance is saying, I have no money. And so there's always going to be some kind of intent, uh, uh, um, dissension, right? Some frustration, some tension in the business. And so it's designed to cause conflict. Now, if you're all those departments, no wonder why you're burnt out. Because you're going, I don't have any money. But your possibility side says, but I have to spend money so I can attract the right customer. I have to do advertising so people see me. But your, your money mindset, the scarcity that you're living in says, but we have no money, we have no money. I get it, right? There has to be that dual conversation of going, here's my budget. And so if I'm gonna spend this amount of money on um, an ad, if I'm gonna spend it on building a beautiful website, it has to get a return on investment, 
right? So I always look at what do I have to sell every single month, like no kidding for break even. Break even is everything's paid, right? So you have to know that number. If you don't know that number, you fly blind for months and then all of a sudden you're like, like your, your friend did, holy shit, we're in the hole. Well, she was flying blind. Nobody was going over that with her every single month because she's a smart and talented woman. I know she is, right? That happens ongoingly is I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look at that. I'm busy selling. I'm busy selling. I'm busy selling. Well, just because money's coming in, that was my first, you know, million dollar business. Money was coming in hundred thousand dollars every month. I shouldn't have money problems. Oh, but we were spending, you know, 110 every month. <laughs> so that doesn't work. And so by being okay with what is, what do I have to do? Like no kidding every month to hit these revenue goals. Now, what I also see is people have a back door, meaning I don't have to. So if you don't have to sell, like I see this with what we call parallelpreneurs, meaning they have a job and they're building a business. If you have a job that's paying you a hundred grand a year, you don't necessarily have to hustle to make a hundred grand a year. So that back door, or if you have a spouse, significant other, somebody else that's helping you pay bills, you don't have to do it. I've always been by myself, right? So I've always had to take care of myself, provide for myself, never had a back door. And even when I got married and my husband, who's now my husband, <laughs> had a job, I didn't rely on his money. I still, it was, I have this accountability responsibility I have to pay every month. And so there has to be that accountability for yourself to what, what is my revenue goal? And don't go home, don't quit, don't go to bed until it's done. Too many people give them an out, we're lazy. Stop being lazy. Go, if I'm gonna sell 10 things, what do I need to do to sell 10 things? My team says this to me all the time. She goes, Josie, who's my operations person, she goes, Susie, we get in a financial crunch and then the next day you're closing clients. Like, it, it's amazing. I'm like, yeah, cause I have to. <laughs> there is no, who else is gonna close them if I don't close them? You know, it's having that hunger, you know, as Les Brown says, get hungry. <laughs> well, you also talk in the book about streaming our way to big profits. And in your book on page 236, you write about doing videos, the importance, because you maintain we must shoot videos with us in the videos because videos convert. So my question to you, Susie, is, is that still true? And if so, what's your recommendation? A oh lot of people God. like, I don't want to see myself in video or I don't know what to talk about. The camera starts rolling. I'm the expert and I'm like, hebeta, hebeta, hebeta. So <laughs> what do you do with people like this? Oh my gosh, I love that. So my YouTube strategist, when I first met him, he said, Susie, your clones are lazy. I'm like, who are my clones? And I'm going to fire them. He goes, your YouTube channel, they're lazy. Right. You you're you don't have a presence there. You're not focusing energy on there. You're getting around to it. Your YouTube should be getting you leads every single month. I'd never looked at it that way. Now, people need to build a relationship with you before they spend money with you, before they open up that wallet, before they take out a credit card. Right. They're like, I have to know Debbie. Videos are a great way for people to see your personality. And I get it, I hate doing them too. I am not gonna lie, I don't like doing them. I don't want to, I don't wanna do Facebook Live. I don't wanna do Insta Story, I don't want to. I'm busy being busy, but it's part of my strategy. So the first thing I do is I create production days where all I'm doing is videos, where I'm not trying to do them every month, right? I'm doing a production day where I'll do anywhere between 12 and 25 videos in that day. And that will last me anywhere between two to three months. Now, we as a society want micro learning. Micro learning is short snippets of content. Think about TikTok. It's the newest social media craze. A minute to three minutes tops. And I know after three minutes, I'm swiping. Debbie, I don't know about you, but I'm like, eh, that's boring. Here's what you wanna do in your video. Simple, what, why, and how. What it is, why I need it, and how I use it, right? Or how I get in contact with you. So if you don't have to be, and nobody wants professional scripted videos. They wanna see your personality. They wanna see who you are. And you know what? Everyone's not gonna like you. Sorry, let's find the people that do. Some people think I'm annoying. Some people don't like my voice. Some people, right? It's like, whatever, I don't like you either. <laughs> and just go, there's gonna be a tribe for you, right? Again, I had a client who was overweight and she's like, Susie, no one wants to see me. Well, 
you know what? Her videos were so successful and her tribe was just like her. They were heavier set people, women of color. They wanted to see the real authentic person going, wow, she's so like brave to put herself out there and talk about issues of success and weight and putting herself out there. So everyone wants to see uh, the version of themselves. So in your videos, you want to be authentic and real. And if you don't, I, I say in my videos, I don't love doing this, but I'm doing it because I want to serve you. Right. Even speaking, I still, that was not my genre. I did not want to speak. That That's was not so my surprising. Having seen you on stage. Oh, wow. I, want to. I had to feed my children, Debbie, and I had to figure out where can I get in front of 50 women fast. Right. Cause I needed, I was a single mom raising two kids. I didn't have the luxury or the back door of someone paying for my overhead. If I didn't get in front of 50 women, right. And close some people to come in for my products or services. I, I didn't have money for the month. And so that's how I started speaking. And as much as it was torturous on the other side, I loved it. Right. I went through so much like, struggle and crying and whining. And then I would do it. I'm like, Oh my God, that was so fun. <laughs> I totally relate. A hundred percent. I mean, people like us were built to speak and I have so much resistance every time. And I used to, well, I don't have really nerves anymore, but I used to have so much angst, you know, I wouldn't even sleep. And then I right. get on stage and it was like rock and roll time. And I get I off still the don't sleep before an event. Do you? I don't. I visualize it. I'm like, are they going to like me? And I'm going to say the right thing. And the whole time I'm awake and, you know, and then you're on fire and then you crash for two days after. <laughs> totally. Oh, it's so funny. You know, sometimes people are built to do things. It's, it's just your hump to get through. But you do say that your net worth will only go as high as your self-worth. Those are powerful words. So what, is there something that every business owner must do to up their self-worth so their net worth can come up with them? Yeah, in chapter one, we talk about your mindset, right? And your money mindset. And most of our money mindset or our money beliefs are inherited. They're inherited from our parents, they're inherited from our communities, they're inherited from our church. Like think about the conversations that you heard around money as a kid from your parents, from your community, from school. Right. I heard there is none. Don't ask. Right. That's what I learned is it's you can have money, but it's hard work. Like you got to work hard for the money. Right. There's even a song work hard for the money. I'll keep my day job. Y'all. That's not my job. <laughs> right. And to go. Oh, so I spent years working hard to make money. And then 10 years ago, I'm like, I don't want to kill myself to make money. What? Let me shift this. If it really is a money mindset, let me shift it to go. How can I, that's where I started math is money, money is fun. That's where I started wealth is your birthright is I, I wanted to shift my conversation of the struggle. It was me struggle. I made a million dollars, but I lost 70,000. Right. <laughs> and so it starts with looking at what's my belief system around money and then reinventing that. I created a whole new money mantra, right? We grew up with nine kids, Bobby, Ronnie, Stevie, Terry, Joni, Shelly, Susie, Kelly, Debbie, <laughs> nine kids. Right, six girls, three boys, 1,200 square feet, one bathroom. I have no idea how we did it, right? Two and a half bedrooms. Where do nine people sleep in two and a half bedrooms? Like, right, everything was a hand-me-down, everything, right? I remember my first little job, and this is why I wanted money, Debbie. My first little job, I just wanted my own underwear. That's all I wanted. So I went and got a babysitting job. I did yard work so I could buy my own underwear and hide them from my sisters. <laughs> So you got to find the thing that motivates you to shift the paradigm that you're in around money, right? A lot of students have this money's hard, money's evil, right? Um, so find out what that is for you. There's amazing courses, right? We give you a bonus course when you go to our website and buy the book off our website. I give you a money course about looking at your money blocks. Again, as a bonus, because I, I, I'm trying to give tools because it, it's not enough I realize that I can give someone the strategy, but if they don't have the right money mindset, they're going to sabotage. And then I got to deal with the sabotage. I'm like, let's get that handled. So if we're going to make millions, we're going to keep millions. Yeah. yeah. And I relate to you so much. I grew up as the daughter of a single mother who taught music in schools. She didn't make a lot of money. There was two of us. And if it wasn't for my grandparents, I don't know, we couldn't have made it. We just couldn't have. They did very well and they helped a lot. 
But I remember every year, every September going to school and all the little girls had brand new dresses and shoes. And every day of the beginning of school, they had another new dress or outfit and just that feeling because I didn't. Right. I always had one pair of sneakers, one pair of flip flops and one pair of, I guess you'd call them dress shoes. And I had so little in my closet and um, that you have that feeling of want, right? Yeah. Lack of like, oh, and being so different. And I, today, hmm, I love me some clothes. I mean, I I'm some making up some shoes and underwear. <laughs> I have so made up for lost time, you know, I just, I allow myself to be clothed in beautiful things and take yes. care of myself in a way that I, you know, nobody could back then. So I, I really understand that feeling. And, and what about you for right now, this coming out of this crazy time and here we are in this year, what is the biggest lesson you're learning or implementing this year? Mm, I love that question. So I'm in a great season, right? There's been several times in my life where I've made a lot of money and it, it's allowed me to go to that next level. And I'm in a different season, right? I, I just left California, sold my house, made an amazing amount of money. I have this second home that we bought in Oregon and I literally have no overhead. Like I, there's so much abundance because I have no overhead. We lived in California, so I'm with Debbie, right? Everything, you're working to provide an overhead for yourself. And to look at that, so I have my training and development company, I have a real estate development company that we invest in real estate and rental properties. And so this season is of ease and grace. And ease and grace financially that I've never experienced before. I've always lived in California. And although I've always made a lot of money, a lot of the money that I've made went to my lifestyle. You know, just go, that's just what it costs to live there. $7 a gallon in California for gas, right? We're, we're at $4.32 in Oregon, right? And that's, Debbie's like, oh my God, it's so amazing. That's my right. water bill in California was $1,000. My water bill here is free because I live in a well. Like $1,000 a month, that's $12,000 a year. What can you do with that 12,000 a year? You know, what can, it starts accumulating faster than it ever has in my life. So instead of me having to sell my way to accumulate my wealth, my wealth is all around me because of how I set myself up early on, right? Looking at my investments, looking at my strategy, looking at what do I want my future to be, right? How do I leverage and monetize my wealth versus spending on my wealth? And I've always been a saver, right? After my first divorce, let me say that. First, my kid's dad, right? I had to file bankruptcy and it was humiliating, right? I didn't even have the $10,000 to pay off the debt that I had. And I said, never again, never again will I ever rely on someone like that and trust blindly the finances. And then never again will I never have $10,000 to pay for whatever it is I need to pay for. And that was all, that was, that was, when you think about it now, 10 grand, that was it. But as a 23 year old woman, that was, you might as well set a million. And that the worst and the best lesson that I had, right? It was truly the gift that was wrapped in sandpaper. It humbled me. It taught me about finances hard, right? And I, I started getting serious about investing and saving and paying cash for everything. So I've always been from that day forth, paid cash for everything. And if I didn't have the cash, I didn't get it, right? I look at it and go, ooh, that's gonna be $1,000 at the end of the month once these bills come in, not buying it. Either I save the money, and something happens when you start saving, you look at that 1,000 and you're like, I'm not spending that money on that. Do you know how hard I had to work for this $1,000 versus swipe a card, swipe a card, swipe a card, <laughs> right? To go to get a chunk of money and then buy something. It's like, do I really want that? I don't think I want that. I think I'll save that. <laughs> That's so powerful. I remember my grandparents paid cash for everything. Every time back then it was a Lincoln, they would get a new Lincoln. You know, they always had beautiful cars and stuff, but it was cash. Yeah. There was no playing. Like they didn't believe in accruing that kind of debt. And today it's rampant, right? Yeah. People are, With it's swipe a card, swipe a card. Like, oh, I've got money. Yeah, but you really don't have money. Right. I have a student client that I, I worked with for many years. So when I started working with her, she was really at poverty level. I believed in her. I believed in her message. Right. And took her business to millions. And her goal was, she said, Susie, I want to make a half a million dollars. 
I'm like, awesome, let's make half a million dollars. So we got her to 100, 200, 250, 300, four, four. And that was her paycheck, not her business. That was what she took home. That's what we W2'd for her business. Well, she was spending 600. And so even though we hit these financial milestones, her mental, her money belief, her poverty mindset grew with her as her financial grew because she still was broke at the end of the year making a half a million dollars. And so if you don't shift your money mindset, if you're not aware of what it, what is that poverty mindset that I have, we all have it in some way, shape or form, unless you were raised around an abundant conversation. I was not, right? And it's not like you were. Like this is a learned behavior. The good news is it's a learned behavior and we can learn it, right? It's not something that's deemed. I'm gonna deem it to you. Here's my little wand, right? Deem, you can have an abundant mindset, right? And be aware. And so every time we got her to a certain level, she'd sabotage. Every time we got her another level, sabotage, right? That's when I realized your net worth will only get as high as your self-worth because she never shifted that poverty conversation. She was very generous with her money. She provided for her family and her grandmother and grandparents and son and, you know, but the reality is that to her own detriment of not having the accumulation of wealth. And so I remember being in China and we were with one of the godfathers of our, this man was 80 some years old. And I'm like, why? Why are you still on the road? <laughs> you know, and at first, this is before a couple cocktails. I love what I do. This is my passion. I'm like, I get it. And, you know, at the time, I think I'm 50. I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to be 80 doing this, right? I, I want to choose. Like, it's China. And it, it was a hump. Like, it was a true, like, everyday speaking, you know, and I'm like, 80. And so a couple cocktails in, he's like, well, the reality is, our, my I went into business with my daughter and we didn't, I didn't manage the money. And so I have to keep our lifestyle going. And I'm like, oh, it would be awful. Like to work that hard and to be in a place where you have to be on the road. You have to. That's continue. slavery. Yeah, You're that, literally a slave to your right. business and a slave to the dollar. That's not choice. Right. And that's not setting yourself up. That's not having the discipline. Wealth is a long game, not a short game, right? Each of those stories that I tell you were short games. I'm spending, I'm spending, I'm spending, I'm spending, I'm spending, right? I was lucky enough to get with a financial advisor at 25 and said, Susie, from this day forth, you will create these 401ks. You will create these investment plans that you can never touch. I'm like, okay, well, at the time it was a hundred bucks, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saving a hundred bucks, but <laughs> But now it's accumulated into this amazing nest egg that I can go, oh, here's some money here. Here's some money here. Here's some money in my real estate. Here's some money in my business. Right. When I look at it, I've got five revenue streams from my wealth creation, not just from my business. And to go, oh, well, what do, how do I want to leverage this now? Right. Money just gives you choices. That's all it gives you. It gives me choices like your grandparents. I'm the same way with my grandchildren. What can I do that my children can't because they're paying bills, they're paying overhead, they're in California, so they're paying $7 a gallon for gas, right? All of a sudden the extracurricular stuff goes away. But my abundance helps my family, my abundance helps my community, my abundance helps other entrepreneurs, right? That's the joy of setting yourself up to be financially free. And it, it doesn't have to be hard, it has to be consistent and disciplined. You can start as little and then, and slowly over time, you know, do more. And I'll add a personal note to what you just said, which is make sure to write this stuff down somewhere. So if you have accumulated wealth, if you have pockets of savings for retirement or otherwise, seriously, whether it's in a will or a trust or some kind of legal document, because my mom contracted Alzheimer's and I was the only one here in California who could assist and it was mystifying. How will we move her into a facility? She has no money. There's nothing. And God bless my brother. I don't know how he did what he did or unearthed, but mom actually had like pretty good money socked away, like money that would take care of her for decades. And it was shocking to see the number when he somehow figured it out. But if it wasn't for his persistence, we would have never known she actually had amassed wealth 
and in her forgetfulness didn't even know she had it anymore so we didn't know so this kind of stuff like also leave a breadcrumb trail not for hackers but you know for people yeah, for your family you. exactly it's really yeah. important yeah and a trust in a wheel when you look at no matter how much money you have right you don't want yeah. to give that to your children or your grandchildren your spouse your family someone has to be accountable for that take care of them and to go what what do i do with that life insurance when you have a family right there's so many creative ways don't Try to figure out on your own, find the person that can help you, right? And again, network. You get, we have to start talking about this. Nobody talks about like sex, right? Everybody wants it. They want money and sex, but nobody wants to talk about those two things. I'm sorry, you got to talk about money. It's not rude. It's like, Debbie and I, let's have a conversation. What do you do? I, on my podcast, I ask, what's your best financial, your wealth strategy? What's the one thing you do, right? That's different than anybody else. Because it's just interesting to go. And I'm learning so much every day to go, oh. I haven't done that one yet, or it validates what I've done, right? Everybody's investing in Bitcoin. I haven't done that yet. And I keep, <laughs> it's like, oh, I haven't done that yet. It's still too new for me, which probably then I missed the curve, but whatever. I got other strategies. <laughs> exactly. I understand. Well, what do you do every day, Susie? What do you do that helps you maintain this centeredness or feeling grounded and helps you create what you do? Mm. What's your practice? I got lots of practices. One, I, you know, I still have an active book is, and working. I'm, I still work full time. I love working. I work full time, part time, meaning the days, the times that I'm working, I'm working and the times that I'm off, I'm off. Right. What really fills my soul. I know this sounds corny, but it's my family. Right. My children and my grandchildren. That is my why. My children are my why. I grew up in a very abusive home. Right. Physically abusive, sexually abusive, mentally abusive. And I swore I would protect my children. I swore I would have a better relationship with them. I swore I would be an amazing mom. And my children are my why, right? They, they give me purpose. They, to see who they are as women is inspiring. Who they are as mothers is breathtaking. And so to spend time with them and be able to see what we've created in these human beings and the responsible human beings that they are fill my heart with joy. The second thing is I've got this beautiful property. I know this does not look like something Susie would do, but I love getting out there and chopping down trees and weed whacking and making my home beautiful. I've got two acres of green abundance, right? And so taking on projects that fill my soul that do that creativity thing, whether it's flipping houses, right? Making this home beautiful. Um, that's part of my why. I live on the river, so my morning is spent drinking my coffee, meditating, wa watching the river. It, it is like Animal Planet here. I'm a California kid, and you see all kinds of wilderness here. Yesterday, my dog almost killed the turkey, like a wild turkey, brought it home in its mouth, and it's all mangled. And, you know, my man had to shoot the turkey, and I'm like, where am I? I feel like Zsa Zsa Kabor in Green Acres. <laughs> But just the wildlife and to see, like, we got bears on the property. It's like, where am I? Like, it's a whole new season. And to be outside and be in nature just fills my soul. Mm. The biggest thing is, you know, making a difference for my students and my clients. Is teaching them what I had to learn the hard way. Opening the black, the black curtain to show you. here. Let me just show you how I can make it easier for you. So you don't make the same mistakes I did. You'll make different ones, but at least you have someone to ride or die with you to help you to make that journey easier. Beautiful. And what are you next year to dream, Susie Carter? What are your future dreams and goals? Well, it's been uh, 10 years since I've been married. So I'm getting married in September, in October, October 1st. So I'm getting married, which is very exciting and very scary and very nervous. And so starting a new chapter with my man, we've been together for nine years. And so that, you know, that's a process that we're doing and, and in the reinvention of what is next, right? I've traveled all over the world. I've done so much with my life that I'm in the inquiry of what's this new season look like. So I know, but I don't know. What are you afraid of in getting married? Well, I've, I've, I've done this twice. <laughs> so I, I, my track record is not so good. <laughs> But this relationship, we've been together for nine years, which is amazing. And now I know, right? I know what marriage is. I know what it isn't. And, I, you know, I don't want to 
I don't want to ever go down that path again, right? Just that, you know, I've taken a long time to decide if this is the person, right? And he's like, finally. <laughs> oh, we got engaged That's a year, awesome. a year later, but we just took our time and getting to know each other and, you know, integrating them into your families and your life. And so just Yay. scary, exciting. Yes, very exciting. I'm so happy for you, Susie. That's mm -hmm. soon. And I know you're going to be an amazing, present and powerful, beautiful bride. And folks, if you want to check out more about her, the event she's talking about coming up in September, working with her privately, etc., you can go to Susie, S-U-S-I-E, Carter, D is in dollar, that's C. A R D E R dot com, Susie Carter dot com. And I end today's show with this quote from Susie Carter Overcome fear and anxiety, and you'll create miracles even when you have nothing. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream podcast. And next week on the show, I'm featuring Alan Steinfeld, who for 30 years has hosted and produced the weekly TV series, New Realities in New York City. With his media appearances, lectures, and conferences, he informs millions about human potential, remote viewing, and the nature of alien contact. For over five years, Alan Steinfeld has emceed the largest UFO event in the country called Contact in the Desert. I hope that you will start to employ everything that you learned today, because it's not just about daring to dream. It's about daring to create all your realities, your money, your business, your lifestyle, your freedom into your reality. Thanks for joining us today.